Anthony T. Hinks wrote, it's when the words are on the tip of my tongue that my mind is elsewhere. Okay. Josh Billings, I don't think from Goodrum, the best time for you to hold your tongue is the time you feel you must say something or bust. <laughs> I'm questioning that a little bit, you know, but, you know, wisdom will tell us maybe sometimes we do need to keep it shut. Uh, Mike Bell, the chatterer reveals every corner of his shallow mind. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, it doesn't say his or her either. I don't know whether, whether that's significant. <laughs> now, this is a little bit more serious. Uh, well, a lot more serious. Isra Israel Moore Aivor wrote, Words can be medicines. They can also be poisons. Words can heal. They can also kill. It all depends on how, when, and where they are used and against whom. Let us not abuse our words. It's a misuse of the tongue. And Jeff Lindsay said, I had killed our careful relationship by driving my tongue through its heart and pushing it off a cliff. Oh. <laughs> oh, I got a joke. Yeah, yeah. There's a joke. It's got two characters. It's got, it's got teeth and, uh, and tongue. Yeah, we... That's Melissa. She, we don't have a switch for your mic unless we get... Okay. okay, back to this joke. We don't want to lose the, we don't want to lose the, the audience. So there's, there's uh, these two characters in this very small joke, teeth and tongue. Teeth says to tongue, if I just press a little, you'll get cut. Tongue replies, if I misuse a single word, all 32 of you will come out. Yeah. So this one's called The Taming of the Tongue, the topic today. And uh, we're back in the, the, the book of James, and we have a, um, you know, a, a reminder from James about the use of the tongue. Now, just, just as a little bit of a refresher, it's, and I think this is important, especially in this particular text, James was the brother of Jesus. So uh, we, we would say he's the half-brother because... Uh, his father wouldn't have been Joseph, but his mother would have been Mary. And uh, James was ended up being, uh, early on in the, in the days of the church, if you read through the book of Acts, this James became basically the main, the main person who remained in Jerusalem. The, the followers of Jesus, the disciples and apostles, uh, <clears throat> they, they seem to have got dispersed and gone elsewhere. Uh, to a large degree, but uh, um, James seems to be the kind of the presider over the council in, in Jerusalem. Uh, so he, he uh, the Gospels are quite clear that Jesus had, I think, four brothers. One was James and one was Jude, who is uh, the author of kind of the last of the, the little epistles before the book of Revelation in the New Testament. So, uh, so, so James would have grown up with Jesus, although he did not follow Jesus, uh, when Jesus was uh, doing his ministry, but apparently he 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 converted or he you know he, he became a strong Christian uh, sh sometime after Pentecost. Um, interestingly, I find they have similar styles in the way they talk and the way they so so the, the stories that Je we, we have of Jesus are very colorful. He tells these wonderful parables. He's like the best poet ever. He's, they're, they're full of poetry. They're full, full of colorful language. And we find a hint of that in James, more so than in, um, more so than in, say, Paul. So James has a lot of little, little parabolettes or little picture, uh, word pictures, like we have in this passage before us. So, um, so th this is what you might categorize as wisdom. Remember the, the gentlemen were all being, uh, what's the word, admonished? To, to be careful and to, to seek after wisdom at the uh, isolated men's breakfast yesterday by reading in the book of Proverbs. So, so this is in, in that area, the area of wisdom literature. <clears throat> it's advice, it's warning. But first, before we take it, here, here's the thing. When we preach and when we, when we seek to make disciples, we have to be careful to, to, to again and again remind people it's not a set of rules. It's not something that you can go like, you know, you can go to school and learn how to type or learn how to uh, drive a certain kind of machinery. There's just certain rules laid out, and if you follow those rules, it'll work. 
Um, the Christian life isn't like that. And sometimes I, I have a bit of a problem you know, when, when people have studies and such, and, and they say, well, here's the thing now, here, what is the application? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that's totally not useful, but we have to be careful to think, well, I'm going to apply that and change myself. Because that's not how the, the Christian life works. The Christian life is a, a work of God. You and I are God's workmanship. Now, we use the Word of God, and, and as we feed on it, it's, it's much more like the growth of a plant than it is, you know, the learning of a whole set of rules or something. It's, it's the life of God, the life of Christ being formed within us. And it's a long, slow process, like watching corn grow. So corn's one of the faster growers. Okay, watching spruce trees grow. <laughs> so we feed, and, you know, we, we water. But Paul, like, Paul uses uh, a lot of agricultural metaphors. He says, he says I, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So the only Christian growth, only, Christian growth only happens when God applies the Word of God to your life, and you grow. And it's you know it's a gradual, slow process over time. Uh, so, and it's by grace. But but this part, the taming of the tongue, I suppose, is is a big part of holy living. We are called to be to live holy lives. Uh, scripture says, "I you you will be holy because I am holy." And if you remember, the, the title of the person, uh, the, of the Godhead, who is most intimately involved with us is the Holy Spirit. And what he does repeatedly is, is uh, kind of move us and form us into ways of holiness. Not holier than thouness, but holiness, God-likeness. Uh, it's, it, the, the word, actually, in the, in the Bible, the word holy is more like uh, set apart. So this is... To, to, to go full circle, why we, we sang refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. So that's actually somebody's done a little bit of biblical research there because that, that line is actually what the word means, set apart. So all the holy things in Scripture were the things that were set apart to God, like the, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and the priests and the people of Israel themselves were, were those, the holy people. They were set apart from the world for God, and so are we. As now the new Israel... Uh, the people of God. We are set apart for his purposes. So, so we have these word pictures here to, to tell us how powerful the tongue is. And he says, <laughs> we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, and we can turn the whole animal. So I don't know how many of you have ridden horses or know much about horses. I mean, Craig had done a fair bit, apparently. <laughs> but the bit is not very big. It's a few inches long. It's a little, little steel bar. You put it in the mouth. And, you know, you have, of course, the reins that you use on it. But th this beast is like up to like a ton. And you get on its back, and you can make it do whatever you want. Steer it around just with this little bit. Or if, if a ship, he says, uh, ships, they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder. Uh, so all of you boaters and sailors, you, you know this to be true. Now, th th those may not be illustrations that are commonly... Uh, as common in, in their world as they are in ours. No, as common in our world as they were in theirs. <laughs> it's very difficult when everybody's very quiet and got a, got a mask on. I mean, it's like, there's no response. <laughs> but it's better than it was before I had anybody. So, um, it, so, so I'm thinking maybe a modern day example would be like the power switch in your, in your building or your house. You can have one little switch, go click. And it shuts off all the power in the house, or alternatively turns it all on. It's powerful, powerful things. Uh, small things can, can bring a lot. Or, or the, the little key that you have for, to start your car. You know, start your car, and pff, then you've got all this power at, at your behest. So, so he says, the tongue is like that. It's very tiny. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. <laughs> well, it does. I mean, boy, it, it just... With our tongue, we steer our lives almost, and we can change other people's lives, for better or for worse. So, um, yeah, so, so, I mean, it is small. It's, probably, it's smaller than my hand, but it's way more powerful than my hand. It's smaller than my foot, but it's way more powerful. It's smaller than my leg, but it's way more powerful. <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a potent thing. So um, that's kind of what he said. He, he's, he's describing to us. Take, take it seriously. Uh, in, the, in the context of the whole gospel, of course, um, we, we aren't going to change our words by 
by willpower and all that kind of stuff. Jesus says something which I think is very pertinent here, which is, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's as our hearts are changed, which is the, the gospel is really about changing us inside from the inside out. So as our hearts are changed and softened and gentled and, and uh, reworked by God's grace, then our speech changes. So I think that's true. But James is looking at it from the other end, and he's telling us to watch out for the damage that you can do with your speech, or that I can do with my speech. So, for instance, he says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of their life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. He's not mincing words, and he's got very colorful language, much like Jesus, as I mentioned. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by people, but no, no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how he, you know, he, uh, he wants to emphasize to us the damage it can do. So how many of our friendships have we damaged or even lost because of things that we've said or they, that have been said to us? How many marriages have been broken because the communication of word either was lacking or was, was uh, destructive, you know, verbal abuse. How many, um, how many children have been severely impacted by the words spoken to them when they were young, when they were told they couldn't do this, they can't do that, they're too little for this, um, you know, or, or worse, you know, you're never going to make anything of yourself, or you know, you, you're not really worth doing that. You know, th there's been a horror... Uh, you know, a horrible travesty of, of children belittled when they're young, which has affected their whole lives because they have that impression of themselves. They believe that. <laughs> or political careers. You, notice that as we were running through this election, that everything that everybody's saying is watched, every word is analyzed and <laughs> repeated on, in the news. So you can, you can imagine how... Uh, how nerve-wracking that is for if you were a politician. And, and you know, a misstep can, can lose you the election. Political careers die. Usually these, these, uh, these politicians have speech writers. You know, they have, they have, they have uh, talking points that, that are written beforehand. So you imagine how they sit on, when somebody like the previous president was talking and, you know, the speech writer was on the side watching how, how much nervous trembling and shaking was going on. <laughs> They're not going to stick to the text. <clears throat> so, yeah, political careers. Now, we, I think we need to add here to continue to bring the gospel back in that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the antidote for the damage that is caused by people's words. I mean, what do we do once the poison that he talks about, it, no one can tame the tongue, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So what's the antidote? And it's the gospel. Because if, if we harm one another with our words... How do, we, how do we get back? How do we come back from that? And the answer has got to be forgiveness, which is the core, core principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, God himself, came into our world and died for us that we might be completely forgiven. Therefore, <laughs> we, we, it behooves us. I mean, it, it falls upon us to forgive each other as we have been forgiven. Over and over again, the New Testament lays this out before us, even when it's terribly difficult. And real forgiveness really isn't cheap. It's painful. I mean, you really, uh, it's because people have actually hurt us or we have actually hurt someone. We actually have. And we need forgiveness from one another, conveyed somehow. And, and that's, that's a core, the, the core, at the core of the gospel, forgiveness, repentance. And repentance is, is kind of like not just forgiving, but understanding that we have done wrong, that there's something twisted inside us, that there's some attitude that is bad. There's some sense of superiority or smugness or selfishness that has caused us to do that thing and to change, the, you know, to, to let our let God change our thinking. And that's an antidote to, to, to the, the language we use. And also the gospel lifts us up. So if we have felt or, or feel over the years that we've been put down, we've been su suppressed or oppressed because of what we believe, who we believe we are, the gospel tells us we are beloved. It tells you that, you that God has made you and he loves you and he, you are unique and special and precious to him. 
And, and, and he loves you so much that he, he, you know, he entered into this world to die for you. He laid down his life for you. And he made you wonderfully, you're fearfully and wonderfully made with all kinds of wonderful talents and abilities. And you, you are a wonder. So the gospel tells us these things and that lifts us up. So that's the antidote. And these truths, the truths of the gospel, need to be carefully conveyed by our words. I mean, that's part of, that's kind of what my, probably my main job is to try to do that. But it says here at the beginning of this, let not many of you be presumed to be teachers, brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. (laughs) Rightly so. Because this is God's means by which he restores people to himself and and changes people's lives and makes us holy and, and, and heals our wounds. How beautiful on the mountains, says scripture, are the feet of those who bring good news. And uh, Jesus said of himself, you know, I, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he quotes Isaiah here, because he has anointed me to proclaim good tidings to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, and, and you know, to, to, to bring liberty to the captives, etc. So, but a lot of it is about the words, to proclaim good news to the poor. Okay, I'm going to change up a little bit. I'm going with this. Words are amazing. They set us apart from the beasts. Uh, We are unlike the animals in that we have language. Now, some will argue, oh, hold it. No, they taught monkeys to talk. So apparently there's a chimpanzee, for instance. They've been teaching chimpanzee sign language for for years. And uh, Washo, the the chimp, was apparently like the the most, um, learned the most of all the chimps. And he learned 350 sign language terms. So he, he could use them or understand them and you know convey what he wanted with sign language. It's pretty amazing. He still couldn't talk, but he could he could communicate using 350 words in sign language. And of course then there's Planet of the Apes, where the apes you know fully converse. Except that's not real. <laughs> that's make believe, right? So uh and there's a whole new Planet of the Apes series. I don't know if you, you know, if you're a Planet of the Apes fan from whenever it was, the 70s, 60s, you know, uh, there was a whole new bunch of them had just come out in the last 10 years or so. Yeah, but it, that's all uh, fantasy. But <laughs> it, here, here's, here's a little uh, a, a bit of factual facts from an encyclopedia or someplace. I forget where I got. Most adult native test takers, <clears throat> so native in the sense that this, whatever your first language is, your mother tongue, most adult, adult native test takers range from 20,000 to 35,000 words. Average native test takers of age 8 already know 10,000 words. Average native test takers of age 4 already know 5,000 words. And that's a lot of words, and they use them all. I had my four-year-old uh, granddaughter with me a fair bit this summer, and boy, she could talk. Could really and really expressed herself quite well. I can readily believe she knew 5,000 words. Adult native test takers learn almost one new word a day until middle age. I don't think it increases after that. It may, it's probably a loss. <laughs> Start to drop a little bit. So language, our words, are one of the many incredible gifts that God has given to humanity. They're, it's an astonishing gift. I mean, he's, he's made us in his own image and likeness. That's a gift. We, we are crafted in such a way as we can do incredible things. We can run and we can play sports and we can, we can make things with our hands and we have brains that conceptualize and, and form all kinds of, kinds of artistic work and do music, go on and on. But <laughs> words, we all have them. With them, we tell our stories. Boy, do we love to tell stories and hear stories. We tell jokes, like that great one I told at the beginning. We paint word pictures. You know, someone, some of us are very, very clever with adjectives and adverbs. My buddy George, you know, he can tell a story, it's just spellbinding. And, uh, he, you know, he tells a story about something that happened to me in, up in the park, and he just tells it so well, you'd think he was there, and he wasn't. <laughs> <coughs> Um, we instruct all our teaching, schools, universities. It's all about words. Uh, you know, it's, we sing. 
Uh, what a delight it is to have words to sing. We express our love. We connect with each other with our love, not, not just to God, but to each other. We read and read out loud and have such great enjoyment. We read to our kids and, read, you know, when we read out loud, we bring great enjoyment to our kids and change their lives. We have long conversations with our friends. <laughs> Boy, do we all like to have to do that, you know? We like to get a little glass of um, tea <laughs> with our buddy and, or a friend and just, just have a chat, just relax and, and share our lives with one another through our words. It's a tremendous blessing. On the other hand, we can be quite hurtful and destructive. As Jeff Lindsay said, I, I read it earlier, I had killed our careful relationship by driving my tongue through its heart and pushing it off a cliff. It's true. So at the, at the end of this passage, James says the, these things, and I think they're important to kind of close with. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse humans who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. But, brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What he's, he's telling us and instructing us and warning us about is that our words are not only for blessing God, but for blessing each other. Our words are for blessing and encouraging and helping and uplifting and healing each other. There's that great passage from, I think it's from one of the Psalms. I didn't look it up. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. And we, we often think, oh, that's for the preacher to, to, to pray that before he starts talking. Yeah, probably. But it's also for us to pray pretty much every time we open our mouths. May the words of my mouth be acceptable in your, you know, in your heart, O oh Lord. So let's be serious about our speech. And, you know, we're going to make mistakes. It's a growing, a place to grow. It's not, it's not just about what we don't say. You know, the answer is not to zip it and lock it and never say another thing so we don't get in trouble. Because although we may not hurt anybody, we're not going to help anybody. So, uh, so we, we need a lot of grace and the wisdom of God and the, and the Spirit of God to guide us in this endeavor. So let's be prayerful about it. Prayerful that our hearts will be changed and softened and humbled so that our words will bring comfort and healing and encouragement and good news to our hearers. Ephesians 4.29, Paul says, Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need and bringing grace to those who listen. It's all about bringing grace to those who listen. Let's pray.